What's up, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, a lot of people have been telling me that I overhype Finasteride. Sure, it works for some, but come on, Kevin. For most people, it isn't going to be enough by itself, and eventually all of us are going to have to use other drugs like topical minoxidil or a stronger 5-AR inhibitor like Dutasteride. After all, Dutasteride lowers serum DHT over 90% versus Finasteride, which only lowers it by about 70%. And more importantly, Dutasteride Finasteride at 0.5 milligrams lowers scalp DHT about 50% versus finasteride lowering it 40%. Even better, dutasteride at the dose of 2.5 milligrams per day can lower scalp DHT by almost 80%. So that leads a lot of people to think that finasteride will only work in the short term and eventually all of us will have to switch to dutasteride, which really begs the question, why even bother starting with finasteride? We might as well just start with the good stuff and join the dutasteride master race right away, right? But is it really necessary? Do we really need to go balls to the wall with our 5-AR inhibition? Or is finasteride by itself good enough in stopping hair loss from androgenic alopecia? Even more important than that, will finasteride be enough to stop hair loss indefinitely? Even a lot of people who are taking finasteride and are pleased with the results they have gotten so far still kind of have that lingering fear that one day finasteride will not be enough and they'll start to lose ground again. People want assurance that the finasteride they are using will still work even when they are much older. This is important to know because I am seeing more and more people telling me they are worried that finasteride isn't going to be enough for them or won't be enough long term. After all, a 40% reduction in scalp THT really doesn't sound like all that much. So let's take another look at finasteride and take our patented balls deep approach to see if we're doing enough to stop our hair loss by using finasteride both in the short and the long term. So Let's take a look at the efficacy of finasteride. We all know that it works, of course, but does it work well enough that we can take it and not have to worry about hair loss at all? Well, fortunately, this is an FDA-approved drug we're talking about here, so there is no shortage of studies on the effectiveness of oral finasteride. This data includes the original clinical studies that resulted in its approval by the FDA, as well as more recent studies. When a lot of studies on the same subject are available, it's often good to see if someone has done a meta-analysis of these studies. A meta-analysis is a way to combine the results of many studies into one big study, and it is a good way to get the most valid results possible from data. As you can see right here, MA, meaning meta-analysis, is at the very top of the pyramid when we look at the hierarchy of scientific evidence. So whenever you are doing research, it is good to know what the quality of the research is so you know what belongs in a serious scientific discussion. So if someone, for instance, wants to claim that dutasteride made their hair loss worse some how, and they can't provide any stronger evidence than just their own anecdote, then you can safely dismiss them as being full of shit and ignore them. So it's good we're working with actual meta-analyses here as opposed to the testimonies of a bunch of hypochondriac crayon-eating morons on Trestless. In fact, we actually have two meta-analyses that examine the efficacy of finasteride for hair loss. The first one is from 2010 that looks at finasteride versus placebo, and the other one is from this year of our Lord in 2022 that compares the efficacy of finasteride versus dutasteride. We also have some data on the efficacy of finasteride versus topical minoxidil, as well as data on long-term finasteride efficacy over at least five years of use. So it's time to massage our scalps and get that blood flow going to our brains, and let's find out once and for all if finasteride is still the first-line choice for treating androgenic alopecia today. The first meta-analysis is from 2010, and it is titled, quote, Efficacy and Safety of Finasteride Therapy for Androgenetic Alopecia, a Systematic Review, unquote. In this meta-analysis, 12 randomized controlled studies of finasteride versus placebo were combined. There were 3,927 male subjects, with 2,152 being on finasteride and 1,775 on placebo. So this was a huge study. It has more subjects than all the subjects in every study ever funded by the PFS Foundation combined. This table here shows the characteristics of the studies included in the meta-analysis. Most of the studies used the standard dose of 1 mg per day of finasteride, though three studies did use 5 mg per day, which is what is typically prescribed for an enlarged prostate. Most of the studies lasted 12 to 24 months. A few were of a shorter duration, and two studies lasted up to 48 and 60 months. So this is already much longer term than most hair loss research, but we have data which is even more long term coming up soon. So these studies all looked at 
different endpoints, including patient self-assessment of the results, hair counts, and global photographic assessment by dermatologists who are blinded to the treatment group. Let's take a look at the results of finasteride assessed by the patients themselves first. So first, let's get oriented to this type of figure. On the left, there are a whole bunch of numbers representing short-term and long-term results from the individual studies. But instead of getting bogged down with all of that, let's concentrate on the graph on the right. This graph is what's called a force plot, and it's important to understand this type of graph because they are used all the time in meta-analyses. Basically, a force plot shows the amount of improvement from a treatment versus a control. So in this case, this force plot is showing us the likelihood that a subject on finasteride would see an improvement in their hair growth versus a subject on a placebo. The vertical line in the middle represents the number 1, and if the result was 1, then finasteride would be equally as good as placebo, which would mean it wasn't doing anything at all. If a point was to the left of that line, meaning less than 1, it would mean that finasteride was worse than placebo, and anything to the right of the line, meaning greater than 1, means that finasteride was better than placebo. Anyway, the little squares with the horizontal lines show the individual study results along with what's called the confidence limits, which is basically similar to the range of these results, and the diamonds show the average results. The bottom diamond shows the overall result of all the studies, and clearly, as you can see, finasteride improves hair growth as assessed by the patients themselves. However, Patient self-assessments can be pretty subjective, and it is hard to determine exactly how effective finasteride is at determining objective improvements like increased hair counts. Fortunately, we see in the next graph here that hair count as assessed by phototrichogram also improved with finasteride. A phototrichogram is a tool that can measure exact hair counts, so it is better at giving us objective measurements compared to researcher or patient self-assessments. In fact, in the short term, meaning less than or equal to a year on finasteride, hair counts improved by 9.42% overall. In the long term, meaning over 12 months, the results are even better with 24.3% increase in hair counts. This goes along with most of the studies on finasteride that show more improvement the longer you are on it, and that is important to keep in mind if you have been on finasteride for less than a year. Oftentimes, people give up and assume the treatment is ineffective when they haven't even given it a year yet. So again, it can take over a year for finasteride to really flex its muscles. So please don't give up. Keep using finasteride and always remember the best is yet to come. Finally, right here, we see the results of a global photographic assessment, and it is clear that finasteride results in improvement in the appearance of the hair as judged by dermatologists. So, based on all this evidence, it's clear that finasteride works, but how does it compare to other treatments? Well, let's dispense with minoxidil first. Minoxidil is a great hair growth stimulant, of course, but it can't compare to finasteride in treating androgenic alopecia. Here's a couple of randomized controlled studies. The first study is titled, quote, An Open Randomized Comparative Study of Oral Finasteride and 5% Topical Minoxidil in Male Androgenetic Alopecia, unquote. This study was a direct comparison of 1 mg of finasteride daily to 5% topical minoxidil applied twice daily. 65 men were enrolled, and the study lasted for 12 months. Overall, 80% of the men on finasteride showed improvement by clinical assessment, whereas only 52% of those on minoxidil improved. This figure shows the results in detail, and clearly men did better on finasteride when comparing the two treatments. Here is another study that compared finasteride at 1 mg daily, finasteride plus minoxidil 2%, 2% minoxidil alone, and finasteride plus ketoconazole shampoo in 100 men with androgenic alopecia. In this figure, group 1 is finasteride alone, and group 3 is 2% minoxidil alone. Clearly, 1 mg finasteride per day is much better than 2% minoxidil, and it's by a long shot, which is no surprise since we already know that finasteride even beats out 5% minoxidil by nearly 30%. Group 4 is finasteride plus ketoconazole, and there was really not any difference from just plain finasteride, which really begs the question as to whether or not ketoconazole shampoos really do anything at all. Maybe they do, but they're clearly not even in the same stratosphere as finasteride and minoxidil. Group 2, however, did the best, and that group 
used a combination of finasteride plus 2% minoxidil. So clearly, finasteride plus minoxidil has an additive and even a synergistic effect, which gives additional benefits compared to using either one alone. That is why the gold standard hair loss stack is finasteride plus 5% topical minoxidil. So none of this is controversial. No one seriously questions that finasteride is more potent than topical minoxidil. After all, unlike minoxidil, finasteride works by actually targeting the root cause of androgenic alopecia, which is the trash hormone DHT. But what happens when it's brother against brother, or finasteride versus dutasteride? Which one reigns supreme in the good fight against the slaphead curse? Well, that brings us to the next meta-analysis. This one was just published this year in 2022. It is titled, quote, Finasteride for Hair Loss, a review, unquote. This article is a good review of finasteride in general, and it includes some helpful figures like this one here. This figure shows how testosterone is converted by the 5 air enzyme in the cells into the trash hormone DHT, which then binds with the androgen receptors in the cell nuclei that then activate signaling pathways and other factors that end up triggering off the long chain of events that ends in the destruction of our hair. Finasteride, of course, stops this destruction dead in its tracks by inhibiting the 5 air enzyme and thus preserves the alpha chad hormone testosterone by preventing the 5 air enzyme from wasting it by turning it into the beta virgin bitch hormone DHT. So, this study was another meta-analysis, and it looked not only at finasteride versus placebo, but also finasteride versus dutasteride. Eight studies were combined, and some of them overlap with the previous meta-analysis we already covered. But since the study was published 12 years after the last one, some of the studies are new. Anyways... The results are presented much like in the other meta-analysis using force plots. Here the endpoint is changed in hair counts per square centimeter with finasteride 1 mg per day versus placebo. The top graph is after 24 weeks and the bottom one is after 48 weeks. The raw numbers showed an increase in hair counts of 12.4 hairs per square centimeter at 24 weeks and 16.4 hairs per square centimeter at 48 weeks with finasteride. This is once again an indication that finasteride not only works, but it works works better the longer you take it. So if you are getting good results with finasteride now, then rejoice because things are only going to get better and your hair will age like a fine wine. The top force plot in the next figure here shows dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams per day versus placebo after 24 weeks of treatment. Dutasteride increased hair counts by 18.4 hairs per square centimeter compared to placebo. The bottom graph shows two studies that did a head-to-head -head comparison between finasteride finasteride at 1 mg daily versus dutasteride at 0.5 mg daily for 24 weeks. Dutasteride, as you might expect given its stronging 5AR blocking capabilities, outgrew hair versus finasteride by 6.1 hairs per square centimeter, which isn't a huge difference, but still a notable one. So, the data shows that dutasteride is stronger than finasteride, and finasteride is stronger than minoxidil. But let's look at one more aspect of finasteride before coming up with some recommendations about which 5 air inhibitor you should use. The last question is, does finasteride work forever? I know a lot of people who have started finasteride as teenagers, and they're now worried that by the time they're in their 30s, the drug won't be effective anymore. But is it really something we need to worry about? Will finasteride work as long as you keep using it? Well. I've touched on the long-term efficacy of finasteride before in another video, which I'll link below, but one source of criticism I got from that video is that the data I cited has the limitation in that the long-term studies were done exclusively in Asian populations. So how is this relevant, you may ask? Well, people like to argue that androgenic alopecia is different in Asians because it occurs less frequently in them. Well, even though it is less frequent, there is nothing else to suggest that the actual disease process is different, even if it is less common in that population. But even if you do believe that Asians have some genetic resistance to hair loss compared to Caucasians, it turns out we do have some long-term data now in non-Asian populations, which confirms that Asian studies are completely valid. So before we get into that, let's review the Asian studies. One of the first long-term studies was this one from Japan titled, quote, Five-year efficacy of finasteride in 801 Japanese men with androgenetic alopecia, unquote. In the study, men were assessed using global photographs after five years of treatment with finasteride at one milligram daily. The results are difficult to believe though. After four years of treatment, there was improvement in 99.4% of men and prevention of disease progression in 100% of men. I mean, 
I'm a big believer in finasteride, of course, but this seems like an outlier study to me, and I find these results hard to swallow. No drug has a 100% efficacy rate, not even lethal injection drugs. Fortunately, there is more data on this, though. In this study from Good Korea, 126 patients who had been on finasteride at 1 milligram per day for at least 5 years were evaluated using photographs. The investigators used their own made-up alopecia scoring system, so it is hard to translate the results into something familiar like the Norwood scale, but anyways, this graph using the Good Korean Norwood scale shows that the effectiveness of finasteride keeps rising and then peaks at two years. After that, it plateaus with only a very small fall off in efficacy. Overall, 85.7% of patients showed improvement on finasteride after five years of treatment. So this study brings us back to what I was saying about the importance of being patient. Finasteride can take up to two years to fully flex its muscles, so people who say they've been on it for two months and it's not working should just take a deep breath and relax. It's going to be okay, chums. Now we're back to the Japanese again, this time with a 10-year follow-up study. In the study, there were 532 Japanese men, and the main assessment was based on global photographs of the hair. This graph here shows the main findings. This graph is especially interesting, though, because it breaks down the results by Norwood class, so I guess the Japanese don't have their own interpretation of the Norwood scale like the good Koreans do. Overall, though, for most Norwood classes, there was continued improvement in hair growth until five years, at which point the improvement tends to plateau. However, those with the lowest Norwood scales, like 1 and 2 at the top of the graph seem to improve throughout the whole 10-year period, while the Norwood 7s at the bottom of the graph get less improvement, and their gains tend to drop off a little over time. So to explain it as simply as possible, the sooner you start treatment, the better finasteride works, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. People who report unsatisfactory results with finasteride are usually those who started when they've already lost significant ground. And now, thanks to this graph, we know exactly why that's the case. The longer you wait, the less effective finasteride is going to be. So this really reinforces the idea that it is important to start treatment as soon as you possibly can before hair loss has had any chance to progress at all. Although even if you have lost some ground, you're much better off with finasteride than without it, so don't give up just because you're a Norwood 3, Norwood 4, or beyond. In fact, the golden option is to start finasteride before you even notice hair loss at all rather than waiting until you've lost ground because finasteride is much better at preserving what you've lost compared to getting back what you've lost. Family history of hair loss is an indicator, but it's not a 100% accurate predictor, meaning you can have a family member with no evidence of hair loss and still have the androgenic alopecia genes and vice versa. So don't think family history is everything. It isn't. Finally, Let's look at the non-Asian long-term study that I mentioned before. This study is from Italy, and it is titled, quote, Finasteride 1 mg daily administration on male androgenetic alopecia in different age groups. 10-year follow-up, unquote. In this study, 118 men on finasteride at 1 mg per day were assessed by photographs over a period of 10 years. So like the Japanese study, this is a very long-term study. The results of the study are somewhat complex, though, because they divided the men by different age groups and by different Norwood classes. There were two main results. Number one, if you are going to respond to finasteride, you will usually start to see some results within the first year of treatment. Number two, if you respond within the first year, there is only a 4% chance your hair will get worse after 10 years, while there is a 28% chance it will be maintained and a whopping 68% chance of further improvement. Overall in this study, after 10 years, only 14% of patients had worsening of their hair loss and 86% had improvement over the 10-year period. In fact, 21% of the subjects had better hair at 10 years than after 5 years of treatment. So this study absolutely confirms that the majority of patients get long-lasting benefits from oral finasteride, and in many cases, the hair continues to improve during all 10 years of treatment. So all of this data confirms that finasteride is an extremely effective drug for treating androgenic alopecia, and its benefits are long-lasting. But there is some data that dutasteride may even be more effective. So why is it that I recommend and starting with finasteride. Well, I am not anti-dutasteride, and I fully believe that both finasteride and dutasteride are outstanding treatments that will stop hair loss in the vast majority of people who use them. One of the reasons I prefer finasteride, though, is that there is a lot more clinical data on finasteride than dutasteride, which is one reason finasteride is FDA-approved for androgenic alopecia, and dutasteride is not. There is also, as I already showed, a lot of long-term data on finasteride lasting up to 10 years that dutasteride doesn't have. 
When it comes to side effects, both drugs are extremely well tolerated and the side effect profiles from both drugs are comparable and I have talked about that in many, many videos you can find on my channel. But overall, I think finasteride might be a safer drug given that dutasteride has such a long half-life lasting 5 weeks versus 6 to 8 hours with finasteride. Thus, if you get side effects from dutasteride, it may take a longer time for them to subside than with finasteride, although I should note that the side effects do subside 100% percent of the time and the idea of persistent side effects from either drug are 100% fear-mongering bullshit and I've done many videos where I prove that post finasteride syndrome is little more than a pseudoscientific QAnon conspiracy theory. So if you want a treatment protocol where you can feel confident in maintaining your hair forever, then the best thing to do is to start with finasteride. If you start early, it probably will be the only thing you will ever need. But just in case you want a little extra insurance for your hair, you can always keep minoxidil on reserve. Although if you want to start with both minoxidil and finasteride at the same time, that's fine too. But just keep in mind that since the drugs work differently, any additional benefits you get with minoxidil on top of finasteride will need to be maintained with minoxidil indefinitely. So just be ready for the long-term commitment if that's what you choose. If you've given finasteride a fair shot and it's been, say, a couple of years, after that time, you can then consider upgrading your 5-AR inhibitor to dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams daily. So if for some reason that's not strong enough, which is extremely unlikely, keep in mind that dutasteride can be safely titrated all the way up to 2.5 milligrams daily, which will suppress 80% of scalp DHT, which is twice as much of what, as what 1 milligrams of finasteride suppresses, and I have a video about that which I'll link below. Again though, I must reiterate with as strong of an emphasis as I possibly can that finasteride will completely stop and even reverse hair loss in the vast majority of people who use it, and this has all been validated through the strongest and highest quality scientific evidence in existence. So you should trust this science far more than you trust some random douchebag on a subreddit who claims without any photographic documentation whatsoever that somehow his hair is getting worse on treatment. These people are either trolling you or more likely they are just hypochondriacs who are freaking out about a shed because they are self-medicating and thus they never received any proper education about the drug. All the hair loss treatments will cause an initial shed and likely repeated sheds will happen as well as it is impossible to keep a hair follicle in the antigen growth phase forever. Anything lost while on treatment will grow back and likely grow back stronger, and I have a video which goes over all this which I'll link below. So please, Chooms, stop worrying about shedding. You should be far more worried about what happens if you stop treatment. And for the love of God, stop worrying that somehow finasteride is going to just magically stop working someday. It isn't some drug you build a tolerance for like alcohol and cigarettes. It works indefinitely, and chances are greater it will work even better in the long term compared to how it works in the short term. So just take your finasteride like an aspirin, forget about hair loss, and go enjoy your life because you've earned it. God bless.